mentor lawyer, if you grew up in the United States, then you, of course, know about Bill Cosby. You know him as a comedian, as the, I guess, opposite of Eddie Murphy, who is an excellent comedian. And when he had his stand-up shows, he would always curse and talk about sensitive issues. Bill Cosby was more like the cleaner comedian who did not resort in, 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 into more sensitive areas and just was funny and an excellent actor and had a really cool show about a nice African-American or black family in the United States. And he was obviously very beloved and it still is beloved by many. Of course, recently we learned about a lot of things that he did in the past or that he allegedly did in the past that were horrible, that there were crimes against women, that he was engaging in misconduct of a sexual nature with many young women. At least those were the allegations. Unfortunately, those things came out many, many, many years after the incidents took place. In some cases, 30, 40 years after the incidents took place. A lot of civil lawsuits uh, were filed. Many are still pending. I think all of them maybe are, are still pending. I do not have an update on the civil cases. But I know that many civil cases were filed against him. I'm assuming that some were settled out of court. But in one case, charges were filed in the state of Pennsylvania against Bill Cosby. And those charges had to do with the allegations of sexual misconduct that were made by someone he knew for quite a while. The name of the victim, and usually we do not discuss the name of victims of sexual crimes. That is something that is kept off the media. Unless the victim makes public statements and makes herself known, and it is known to everybody that she is the victim of this sexual crime. So this particular victim obviously is well known. Her image has been well publicized. Her name has been all over the place. So it's not a secret. Her name is Andrea Constant, Constant, and she's from Canada. She's a former basketball player. She was working at Temple University when she met Bill Cosby, and apparently Bill Cosby had a strong relationship with the university, and that's how they met. And I may read a little bit about the accusations of, about what happened between Mr. Cosby and Miss Constant. But in general, the issue of sexual crimes is a very complex issue um, because of many factors, and I'm not going to go into all of those right here. What I wanted to do is I wanted to explain to you what happened. What happened today at the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania? What happened is that they released an opinion. The Supreme Court released a 70 70, hold on, how many pages? Obviously, I've not read the whole thing yet. 78, 70, 79 page opinion. 79 pages of this they wrote about the Bill Cosby case. This is all their opinion. Then one justice wrote a concurring and dissenting opinion, which is also a few pages long. It goes, how many pages? Let's see. The concurring, so a concurring and descending opinion that was nine pages long. And then you have one justice, Justice Saylor, who wrote a dissenting opinion that is five pages long. So let me first explain what that means. When there is a majority opinion, it means that if there is a the Supreme Court has 
a total of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven justices. So a majority opinion means that at least four of those seven justices voted in one way. And that's what we have here. So the majority sided with vacating the conviction, overturning the conviction in a sense, and discharging him from prison. So Cosby should be released immediately, and probably by now he's already out. Uh, concurring and dissenting opinion, concurring, this is what it means. It means that you agree with the result, you may not necessarily agree with how they got to the result. So this particular justice, Justice Doherty, he agreed with the final result, he disagreed with some of the reasoning by which the other justices in the majority got to that result. And then he also has a dissent. So he also, in part, disagrees with what the majority decided. And then here, finally, have a Justice Saylor who wrote a dissenting opinion, which basically means that this justice completely disagrees with the majority's opinion as well as the result. So what exactly happened? I think the easiest way to explain to you what happened is to read to you first the conclusion of the majority opinion, because that tells you exactly what they did. Instead of reading your 79 pages, I'm not gonna do that, but I will give you the final point here, all right? So let's, let's read their conclusion. Here's what they say. I'm reading. We do not question the discretion that is vested in prosecutors over whether charges should be brought in any given case. We will not undermine a prosecutor's general and widely recognized power to conduct criminal litigation and prosecutions on behalf of the Commonwealth and to decide whether and when to prosecute and whether and when to continue or discontinue a case. The decision to charge or not to charge a defendant can be conditioned, modified, or revoked at the discretion of the prosecutor. However, the discretion vested in our Commonwealth prosecutors, however vast, does not mean that its exercise is free of the constraints of due process. I'm just reading to you guys what they wrote. Back to reading. When an unconditional charging decision is made publicly and with the intent to induce action and reliance by the defendant, and when the defendant does so to his detriment, the defendant here being Bill Cosby, and here's open parenthesis, and in some instances upon at the advice of counsel, close parenthesis, Denying the defendant the benefit of that decision is an affront to fundamental fairness, particularly when it results in a criminal prosecution that was foregone for more than a decade. No mere charging, I'm sorry, no mere changing of the guard strips that circumstance of its inequity. A contrary result would be patently untenable. It would violate long-established principles of fundamental fairness. It would be antithetical to and corrosive of the integrity and functionality of the criminal justice system that we strive to maintain. For these reasons, Cosby's convictions and judgment of sentence are vacated and he is discharged. So it was written, the, the huge opinion is written by Justice Wetch. Now, one, one little point here. I'm assuming that this took a while to write. And all this time, the guy was sitting in prison waiting for a decision. So my decision, my, my opinion to the appellate court, first of all, would be this. If you guys are going to discharge the guy and let him out of prison, maybe do a two-page opinion first say that later you're going to do an explanation, 
by saying, okay, well, the, we're going to uh, vacate the conviction, we're going to reverse the conviction, and we're going to let him out. That's just a little side issue, because I'm sure it took a while to get all of this together and edit it and so on and so forth. But anyway, that's the conclusion. And then I'm going to explain to you what the concurrent opinion says and what the dissenting opinion says. But I think it's important to also give you some of the background. Let me actually go ahead and do this on the video. I want to put on the front of it a picture of Mr. Cosby and Miss Andrea Constant. So just give me a second. Let me add that to the to the video, and then I'll talk. I'll read to you guys a little bit about the factual background as described by the by the court. Okay. One second. All right. So. Okay, so I just added them, a picture of each of them to the thumbnail. All right. So I think, let's see, how many pages is the factual description? I think, uh, you know, I, I did not know the details of this case. But the factual description here, and this is, again, a public record. All of this is public. Is how many pages? I'm going to read to you guys at least at a very minimum. We're going to read to you the the press release at issue in this case. So here's the gist of what's happened. Okay, the gist of what happened is that there there was a former prosecutor who was in charge in the area where this alleged crime took place, who investigated the allegations by Ms. Constant, and because of several factors, thought, okay, well, I don't think I can win. If I file the charges against Bill Cosby, I don't think I'm going to win, so I'm not going to be able to prosecute it at this time based on the evidence I have unless Bill Cosby confessed. Now, this lady who was the victim, the alleged victim, she also had a civil case against Bill Cosby. And so supposedly what happened is that the prosecutor was aware of the civil case, wanted to afford this lady some justice, and issued a public statement, in essence, explaining his decision not to prosecute the case, which would therefore allow this alleged victim to force Bill Cosby to testify in the civil case, to, be, in essence, erase the his right to um, plead the fifth and not testify regarding the issues. Because if the prosecutor says, we'll never prosecute you, now there's no reason to plead the fifth because those statements cannot be used against you. You're not going to be prosecuted. And so eventually he did testify at that in a deposition and made statements that were contrary to his interest. And what happened later is that a new prosecutor took over the office, was elected, and that prosecutor filed charges against Bill Cosby and evidence from that civil case, including his statements during the deposition, were used against Bill Cosby in the prosecution, and he was eventually convicted. That's the gist of what happened and what bothered the justices in this case. What bothered the justices is that supposedly this, kind of like a state attorney would be the term here in Florida, district attorney would be the term that they use over there in Pennsylvania, that the district attorney, in essence, made a statement that Bill Cosby relied on that statement and that in reliance of that statement, he waived a right that he had to plead the fifth and that later on, those statements that he made in reliance of the prior prosecutor's promise that he would not prosecute Bill Cosby were used against him and said all of that was unfair, that it was, 
you know, violation of Bill Cosby's due process rights, and that therefore it would be unfair to uphold a conviction that is based on information that was obtained from a the poisonous tree <laughs> from through through a, an illegal scheme in a sense to get him to confess because without a confession without him saying things that could be used against him they didn't have much of a case the prosecutors did not that's the gist of what happened now let's look at the actual evidence and then i'm going to read to you some of the description of the factual background so let me read to you guys the press release because it's mentioned here from the prior prosecutor that supposedly is what Bill Cosby relied upon. I think they did put a copy here. Let me see. Sorry, guys, this is all just happened. I did not have, uh, you know, just to read this opinion is going to be hours. So I figured many of you have questions and I'm trying to do what I can here on short order to give you as much information as possible. But this is a huge opinion. So let me see. Here we go. The press release stated in full as follows. I'm going to read. All right. Montgomery County District Attorney Bruce L. Castor Jr. has announced that a joint investigation by his office and the Cheltenham Township Police Department into allegations against actor and comic Bill Cosby is concluded. Cosby maintains a residence in Cheltenham Township, Montgomery County. A 31-year-old female, a former employee of the athletic department of Temple University, complained to detectives that Cosby touched her inappropriately during a visit to his home in January of 2004. The woman reported the allegation to police in her native Canada on January 13, 2005, basically about a year later. Canadian authorities in turn referred the complaint to Philadelphia police. Philadelphia forwarded the complaint to Cheltenham police. The district attorney's office became involved at the request of the Cheltenham chief of police, John Norris. Everyone involved in this matter who operated with investigators, including the complainant and Mr. Cosby. The level of cooperation has helped the investigation proceed smoothly and efficiently. The district attorney commends all parties for their assistance. The district attorney has reviewed the statements of the parties involved, those of all witnesses who might have first-hand knowledge of the alleged incident, including family, friends, and co-workers of the complainant, and professional acquaintances and employees of Mr. Cosby. Detectives searched Mr. Cosby's Cheltenham home for potential evidence. Investigators further provided District Attorney Castor with phone records and other items that might have evidentiary value. Lastly, the District Attorney reviewed statements from other persons claiming that Mr. Cosby behaved inappropriately with them on prior occasions. However, the detectives could not find, I'm sorry, could find no instance in Mr. Cos Cosby's past where anyone complained to law enforcement of conduct which would constitute a criminal offense. After reviewing the above and consulting with county and Cheltenham detectives, the district attorney finds insufficient, credible, and admissible evidence exists upon which any charge against Mr. Cosby could be sustained beyond a reasonable doubt. In making this finding, the district attorney has analyzed the facts in relation to the elements of any applicable, applicable offenses, including whether Mr. Cosby possessed the requisite criminal intent. In addition, 
District Attorney Castro applied the rules of evidence governing whether or not evidence is admissible. Evidence may not be inadmissible if it is too remote in time to be considered legally relevant or if it was illegally obtained pursuant to Pennsylvania law. After this analysis, the district attorney concludes that a conviction under the circumstances of this case would be unattainable. As such, District Attorney Castro declines to authorize the filing of criminal charges in connection with this matter. Because a civil action with a much lower standard of, for proof is possible, the district attorney renders no opinion concerning the credibility of any party involved so as to not contribute to the publicly, to the publicity and taint prospective jurors. The district attorney does not intend to expound publicly on the details of his decision for fear that his opinions and analysis might be, be given undue weight by jurors in any contemplated civil action. District Attorney Castor cautions all parties to this matter that we will reconsider this decision should the need arise. Hmm. Much exists in this investigation that could be used by others to portray persons on both sides of the issue in a less than flattering light. The district attorney encourages the parties to resolve their dispute from this point forward with a minimum of rhetoric. Now, I'm a little confused because um, this is a public statement, a, a press release, but it does say here, clearly, District Attorney Castro cautions all parties to this matter that he will reconsider this decision should the need arise. I guess I will have to eventually read this full 79 pages to understand why isn't that enough of a statement to preclude Bill Cosby from testifying because he would think, well, they might change their mind if I say something that can incriminate me. But anyway, the opinion apparently, I read the conclusion already and you saw that in there, they seem to suggest that there was some kind of a promise made to Bill Cosby, um, some kind of assurance that he would not be prosecuted for those for the alleged crimes uh, against uh, or crime against Miss Constant, and that the fact that they later changed their mind, prosecuted him, and used some of the evidence obtained in the civil case against him was such a huge violation of his due process rights that they felt compelled to overturn the conviction. But you just read the press release with me, and it does say there <laughs> clearly the district attorney Castor cautions all parties to this matter that he will reconsider this decision should the need arise. So, weird. Now, let's... Because I really... Um, I have not followed this case closely. So I didn't know the details. I know that it was very, it was covered quite a bit when it happened, when the prosecution started, when he was convicted. But I was a mental lawyer at that time, and I did not cover it very well. I do not know the details. So I learned a lot from just reading the opinion. And I'm going to, first of all, I'm going to read you the introduction to the opinion, the first uh, couple of paragraphs. And then I'm going to read a little bit about the background of um, what allegedly happened between Mr. Cosby and Ms. Constant. All right. So the, begin the opinion starts like this. In 2005, Montgomery County District Attorney Bruce Castor learned that Andrea Constant had reported that William Cosby had sexually didn't I just read that? Oh, no, I was reading the press release. All right, sorry about that. Okay, let me read, start it again. In 2005, Montgomery County District Attorney Bruce Castor learned that Andrea Constant had reported that William Cosby had sexually assaulted her in 2004 at his, at his Cheltenham residence. Along with his top deputy prosecutor and experienced detectives, 
District Attorney Castor thoroughly investigated Constance's claim. In evaluating the likelihood of a successful prosecution of Cosby, the District Attorney foresaw difficulties with Constance's credibility as a witness based in part upon her decision not to file a complaint promptly. DA Castor further determined that a prosecution would be frustrated because there was no corroborating forensic evidence and because testimony from other potential claimants against Cosby likely was inadmissible under governing laws of evidence. The collective weight of these considerations led the Castor, District Attorney Castor, to conclude that unless Cosby confessed, there was insufficient credible and admissible evidence upon which any charge against Mr. Cosby related to the constant incident could be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Seeking some measure of justice for Constant, it says here, DA Castor decided that the Commonwealth would decline to prosecute Cosby for the incident involving Constant, thereby allowing Cosby to be forced to testify in a subsequent civil action under penalty of perjury without the benefit of his Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination. Unable to invoke any right not to testify in the civil proceedings, Cosby relied upon the district attorney's declination and proceeded to provide four sworn depositions. During those depositions, Cosby made several incriminating statements. The Acaster's successors did not feel bound by his decision and decided to prosecute Cosby notwithstanding that prior undertaking. The fruits of Cos Cosby's reliance upon the DA Castor's decision, which is what? Cosby's sworn inculpatory testimony, were then used by DA Castor's successors against Cosby at Cosby's criminal trial. We granted allowance of appeal to determine whether DA Castor's decision not to prosecute Cosby in exchange for his testimony must be, for, must be enforced against the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Thank you so much, Suffragium. That's awesome. I really appreciate it. So let's acknowledge you. Again, thank you so very much for the support. So now let's get a little bit into the factual background. And I'm learning with you guys because I really did not know much about this case. I knew the general accusations, of course. I knew that... Apparently, there was evidence that um, Bill Cosby was using drugs in order to be able to um, have sexual relations with women who were not willing to have sex with him. So that's the general gist of what I've heard. But let's take a look at a little more about this particular situation here. And I'm not going to read. This is a lot of pages to go. Um, I'm going to read some of them just to have a good... Um, understanding of what the specific allegations are in this case. So in the fall of 2002, Constand, the lady, Andrea Constand, a Canadian-born former professional basketball player, was employed as the director of basketball operations at Temple University. It was in this capacity that Constand first met Cosby, who had close ties to and was, a hev was heavily involved with the university. That fall, she, along with a few other Temple administrators, showed Cosby around the university's then recently renovated basketball facilities. Over the course of several telephone conversations concerning the renovations, Cosby and Constant developed a personal relationship. Soon after, his, after this relationship began, Cosby invited Constant to his Cheltenham residence. When Constant arrived, Cosby greeted her, escorted her to a room, and left her alone to eat dinner and drink wine. Cosby later returned, sat next to Constant on a couch, and placed his hand on her thigh. Constant was not bothered by Cosby's advance, even though it was the first time that any physical contact had occurred between the two. Shortly thereafter, Constant left the residence. As the personal nature of the relationship progressed, Cosby eventually met Constant's mother and sister, both of whom attended 
one of Cosby's comedy performances. Soon thereafter, Cosby invited Constant to return to his home for dinner. Thank you so much, Jules. I uh, appreciate it very much. Constant arrived at the residence and again ate alone in the same room in which she had eaten during the first visit. When Constant finished eating, Cosby approached and sat next to her on the couch. At first, the two discussed Constant's desire to work as a sports broadcaster. But Cosby soon attempted physical contact. Cosby reached over to Constant and attempted to unbutton her pants. When she learned, when she, I'm sorry, when she leaned forward to prevent him from doing so, Cosby immediately ceased his efforts. Constant believed that her actions had communicated, had communicated to Cosby clearly that she did not want to engage in any physical relationship with him. She expected that no further incidents like this one would occur. Toward the end of 2003, Cosby invited Constant to meet at the Foxwoods Casino in Connecticut. Constant accepted the invitation and, once at the casino, dined with Cosby and the casino employee, Tom Cantone. After dinner, Cantone walked Constant to her hotel room. Cosby called Constant and asked her to meet him for dessert in his room. Constant agreed. When she arrived, she sat on the edge of Cosby's bed as the two discussed their customary topics, Temple athletics and sports broadcasting. Cosby then reclined on the bed next to Constant. Eventually, he drifted off to sleep. After remaining in Cosby's room for a few minutes, Constant left and returned to her own room. Constant interpreted Cosby's actions as another sexual overture. Notwithstanding these unwelcome advances, Constant still regarded Cosby as a mentor, remained grateful for his career advice and assistance, and did not feel physically threatened or intimidated. Eventually, Constant hijack. Uh, eventually, Constant decided to leave her job at Temple University and return to Canada to work as a masseuse. In January 2004, Constant went to Cosby's Cheltenham residence to discuss that decision. As on her previous visits to Cosby's home, Constant entered through the kitchen door. On this occasion, however, Constant noticed that Cosby already had placed a glass of water and a glass of wine on the kitchen table. While she sat at the table with Cosby and discussed her future, Constant initially chose not to sample the wine because she had not yet eaten and did not want to consume alcohol on an empty stomach. At Cosby's insistence, however, Constant began to drink. At one point, Constant rose to use the restroom. When she returned, Cosby was standing next to the kitchen table with three blue pills in his hand. He reached out and offered the pills to Constant, telling her that the pills were her friends, in quotations, and that they would help her help take the edge off, close quotations. Constant took the pills from Cosby and then swallowed them. The two then sat back down and resumed their discussion of Constance's planned departure for, from Temple University. Constance soon began experiencing, experiencing double vision. Her mouth became dry and she slurred her speech. Although Constance could not immediately identify the source of her sudden difficulties, she knew that something was wrong. Cosby tried to reassure her he told her that she had to relax. When Constant attempts, attempted to stand up, she needed Cosby's assistance to steady herself. Cosby guided her to a sofa in another room so that she could lie down. Constant felt weak and was unable to talk. She started sleeping out of consciousness. So you, as you can see, this is like the date rape pill situation. Why would she take the pills? 
those are the type of things, the complex things that usually arise uh, and make sex, sex crimes, prosecutions of this nature very difficult. So that's a good question, question, Jake. Why is she there if, you know, if, if this guy has been making unwanted sexual advances? Why is she taking pills from this guy that specifically told him, oh, this is supposed to make you relax? I mean, yeah, of course. Those are legitimate questions that any juror is going to have. Moment, so let me go back to reading. Uh, moments later, Constant came to suddenly, finding Cosby sitting next to her on the sofa. She remained unable to move or speak. So in essence, she took the pills because she trusted um, him, I guess. Um, she remained unable to, to move or speak, with Constance physically incapable of stopping Cosby or of telling him to stop. Cosby began fondling her and... Okay, so I'm not going to go into the... Okay, this is a public record, and um, it goes into great detail of what Bill Cosby did to Miss uh, Constant while she was semi-conscious and unconscious. I don't think we need to go into those details here, but it involves different sexual acts that he did while she was semi-conscious and not able to move, or even allegedly unconscious. Um, well, I mean, something happened while she was unconscious as well, supposedly. So when Constant eventually awakened on Cosby's couch in the early morning hours, she discovered that her pants were unzipped and that her bra was raised and out of place. Constant got up, adjusted her clothing, and prepared to leave the residence. She found Cosby standing in the doorway, wearing a robe and slippers, Cosby told Constant that there was a muffin and a cup of tea on a table for her. How kind. Um, Jacques, may I ask you why you're mentioning the law firm? Did somebody ask where, if I work or where I work? Just a surprise. Oh, okay. PayPal. Oh, thanks, guys. I appreciate it for the... PayPal information, yes. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you, uh, Jacques. I think you put the link in there, so I appreciate it. I usually put it in the description. I don't know if I had a chance to do it yet, but I wanted to start this video because, you know, this is a hot topic. It just happened. So here I am. Anyway, so Cosby told Constant there was a muffin and a cup of tea on a table for her. She took a sip of the tea, broke off a piece of the muffin, and left. After the January 20, 2004 incident, Constant and Cosby continued to talk over the telephone about issues involving Temple University athletics. In March of that year, Cosby invited Constant to dinner at a Philadelphia restaurant. She accepted the invitation in hopes of confronting Cosby about the January episode, but the two did not discuss the matter during the dinner. Afterward, Cosby invited Constant to his residence. She agreed. And once there, Constant attempted to broach the subject by asking Cosby to identify the pills that he had provided to her. She then tried to ask him why he took advantage of her when she was under the influence of those pills. Cosby was evasive and would not respond directly. Realizing that Cosby was not going to answer her questions, Constant got up and left. She did not report to the authorities what Cosby had done to her. A few months later, Constant moved back to her native Canada. She spoke with Cosby over the telephone, mostly about an upcoming Toronto performance that he had scheduled. Cosby invited Constant and her family to the show, which especially excited Constant's mother, who had attended two of Cosby's other performances and who bought a gift for Cosby brought a gift for Cosby to the show. Constant kept the January 20, 2004 incident to herself for nearly, nearly a year until one night in January 2005 when she bolted awake crying and decided to call her mother for advice. Initially, Constant's mother could not talk because she was en route to work, but she returned Constant's call immediately upon arrival. During the call, Constant told her 
mother that Cosby had sexually assaulted her approximately one year earlier. Together, the two decided that the best course of action was to contact the police in Ontario, Canada, and attempt to retain legal counsel in the United States. So she finally reports, reports all of this in Canada. It says here that Constant brought up the January 2004 incident and asked Cosby to identify the three pills that he had given to her that night. Cosby apologized vaguely as to the pills. Cosby feigned ignorance, promising Constant, Constant that he would check the label on the prescription bottle from which they came and relay that information to her and so on and so forth. So then it goes on. I mean, this is a huge, huge, huge opinion. All right, I'm telling you, I printed the whole thing. The majority opinion is 79 pages long. He details everything, goes into great detail. And one of the things that I saw in the dissenting opinion is this. So we have the majority opinion. We have, like I said, majority opinion. Oh, Jungmin is here. Bailiffs, I have to ask you a question because there's a little bit of a controversy. Uh, for those of you who are watching this and do not know this channel and do not know uh, all of the awesome mods who help in the channel, Jungmin has been missing for a while, but there has been controversy lately because someone believes, someone said that Jacques was the person who came up with this term bailiffs, and I believe that it was Jungmin Shelley. So Jungmin, if you're here, let's see if my memory serves right. Jacques already said that she was not the one uh, who, did, who came up with it. So I want to know if I was correct when I said that it was Jungmin. So Jungmin, if you're still around, can you tell me, can you confirm whether I'm correct that it was you who came up with this term bailiffs for all the moderators for the channel? I hope you're still around and you will confirm and my memory will be um, uh, will be correct. <laughs> so if she doesn't accept, then you'll take credit. I like that. All right. So anyway, the dissenting opinion, the dissenting opinion is interesting. The dissenting opinion by this judge, Justice Saylor, concludes that the majority got it all wrong because there was no promise to never prosecute. But the justice who dissented feels that there was a lot of things that happened at the trial that were wrong, and therefore what this justice would, uh, would um, vote for is for a new trial for uh, Mr. Cosby. So, yes, you think you did. Yes, I think it was you. Yeah. All right. I did remember correctly, I think. So... <laughs> I do have to thank Suffragium again. That was an awesome donation, so thanks again, Suffragium. All right, let's 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 talk a little bit about the, the dissenting opinion. So Justice Saylor says, I respectfully disagree with the majority's determination that the press release issued by former district attorney Bruce Castor contained an unconditional promise that, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> that the Commonwealth would not prosecute appell appellant in perpetuity. Rather, I read the operative language. It says, District Attorney Castor declines to authorize the criminal, the filing of criminal charges in connection with this matter as a conventional public announcement of a present ex exercise of prosecutor prosecutorial discretion by the temporary occupant of the elected office of the District Attorney that would in no way be binding upon his own future decision-making process, let alone those of his successor. From my point of view, the majority's position that such statements must be laden with qualifications on, the, on, on pain of potentially undermining later prosecutions via an, effect, via an effective conferral of transactional immunity is unsound. 
I also respectfully differ in many material regards with the majority's treatment of the trial court's findings of fact. For example, to counter the trial court's explicit finding that Castor made no promise to, that the Commonwealth would never prom prosecute, the major majority posits that, open quotations, the record establishes without contradiction that depriving Cosby of his fifth amendment right was the A. Castor's intended result. The fact of an unwritten promise, however, was rejected on credibility grounds, and Castor's account of his motivations and align his uncredited assertion of a promise need not be separately contradicted by record evidence to also fall by the wayside. In any event, there are numerous possible explanations why Castor issued a press release reflecting his decision not to prosecute a high-profile matter, as well as for why he subsequently claimed there was a promise not to prosecute, beginning in his, in, with his ensuing correspondence with his successor. Oh, I see. So, oh, thank you so much, Miss Shelley. So here's the deal. It looks like the former prosecutor, Castor, we read the statement together. I read it to you in the beginning of the video. You can go back and look if you were not here yet. But I read the press release at issue. And looking at that press release, I mean, it explicitly states that charges may still be filed. It warns the parties that the decision could be reconsidered later. So what's happening is this. It appears that, that that district attorney lost elections, that there was a subsequent DA coming in, and that this prosecutor suddenly took the position that he made a promise to Bill Cosby that he was not going to prosecute. Maybe he did it on purpose. Maybe he wanted to avoid any further prosecution of Cosby in the future. Maybe he was embarrassed of his decision, we don't know. But the bottom line is that this particular justice is saying that, um, let's, let me continue reading what it says. From my point of view, the majority opinion supplants the trial court's fact-finding fact on criti critical points, including the fact that uh, the, uh, the of a promise and the asserted reliance in contravention of the operative, operative principles of review set forth in the opinion. So here's the deal. When, when a matter goes on appeal to an appellate court and the trial court makes factual findings, unless those factual findings are not supported by evidence, usually the appellate court's not gonna mess with the facts. The facts are the facts and then the appellate court makes a decision on the legal issues. So here, what this justice who dissented is saying is that the majority in describing the facts, describing the supposed promise made to Bill Cosby and his reliance on that promise, is kind of not going with the exact facts as found by the trial court, but making their own facts. They're making up their own facts. It happens sometimes on appeals that you read the opinion if you're a party involved in the appeal. I've seen it myself where I'm like, where did this fact come from? Sometimes there are mistakes, and sometimes, you know, there are some liberties that perhaps are being taken. I, it's hard to tell, but it is what it is. So this justice is calling the majority justices out, saying, hey, you guys are modifying the facts a little bit here, and you cannot do that. So this justice, Sailor, says, for, this reason, for these reasons, I respect, respectfully dissent relative to the court's order directing a discharge. I note, however, that I have substantial reservations about the trial court's decision to permit the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania to present testimony from other assertive victims of sexual assaults by appellant, Mr. Cosby, which allegedly occurred between 15 and 22 years in the past. Since under the majority's approach, the issue is now moot, I merely take the opportunity to note that my present tentative inclination would be to award a new 
trial grounded upon appellant's challenge to such evidence as being unduly prejudicial. So the dissenting justice, instead of just discharging him forever, saying, okay, you, you know, you'll never be prosecuted, would say that he only deserved a new trial. The concurring judge, Justice Doherty, that's the one I think who wrote a nine-page opinion, and all of this is available on the internet. For those of you who want to find a copy, I think I should just get you a link. What do you guys think? Would you all like a link? And you can just look at the document. Give me a second, and I'll find it for you. It's divided into three parts. So you have to uh, a link to each part. Uh, you have to click on each part to access it. So Hmm. There's a LeBron James case too. <laughs> Let's see. They just posted that case. They issued several opinions today, so I'm just trying to find the best link for you guys. One sec. Oh, yeah, Commonwealth versus Cosby. Yeah, so you have to simply scroll down. So let me put this link right here there's the link so anyone who wants to actually take a look at the opinion you can and you would go to that website you go to court opinions and then you scroll down until you find this case that's Commonwealth versus Crosby. So why, why is LeBron James having an opinion today also? Is it the celebrity court opinion day today? Uh, oh, Jose LeBron. So it's not LeBron James. All right. Never mind. Never mind. I thought it was LeBron James. It was LeBron J for... Jose Lebron. <laughs> All right. So now you guys have a link to the opinion. Uh, if audio is available of uh, of what, Jack? I'm looking at some of the questions before I continue here. I think that he has been released because the discharge is a discharge, so they should immediately process him out, basically. So you have the link. You have the link. And um, the concurring, and let me just talk a little bit about the concurring. And um, there was a trial. There was actually a trial of Cosby, and I'm assuming that that was played on YouTube, so that must um, that must be available somewhere. I'm assuming, uh, and they probably I don't know if there was a oral argument. Um, could be I, I should look it up, but there might not have been. Um, all right. So what about the concurring and dissenting opinions? So here's what Justice Doherty wrote. By publicly announcing that appellant William Cosby would not be charged with any crimes related to Andrea Constant, 
a decision apparently made in part to force Cosby to testify in Constance's future anticipated civil suit. Former Montgomery County District Attorney Bruce Castor intended to, and in fact did, force Cosby to give up his Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. Ten years later, Castor successfully used the damaging evidence Cosby turned over in the civil case to convict him of the same criminal offenses he had previously been induced to believe were off the table. I am constrained to agree with the majority that due process does not permit the government to engage in this type of uh, coercive bait and switch. However, while I share in that conclusion and agree with much of the majority's well-reasoned analysis, I part ways from it in several material respects, most notably the remedy. Thank you again, Jules, for your second contribution tonight. So what is this justice saying? The main thing is this, is that I guess uh, Justice Doherty doesn't think that Bill Cosby should be discharged. I think what he's going to get to, or she, I'm not sure if this is a male or female justice, but what Justice Doherty is going to get to is, in essence, that he should be tried, but there should not be any use of any of the evidence that came from Cosby's reliance on the promise that he would not be prosecuted. So if there is independent evidence to prosecute him and to, you know, have a trial against him and convict him, then fine, you can do that. But I'll go ahead and read some of this opinion. I begin by addressing an underlying issue that the majority says little about but which I believe looms large. Castor's apparent belief that as an elected district attorney, he could forever preclude, preclude his successors from prosecuting Cosby. I'm not gonna address that. He's in essence, this justice in essence is saying that uh, a person who's standing as the district attorney or the state attorney here in Florida cannot uh, pre, you know, make a promise to somebody and forever prevent somebody or, or can prevent the next person elected from filing charges against someone that this particular state attorney or district attorney decided not to prosecute. And I agree with that. In general, that's an uh, incorrect statement of the law. A, pro a state attorney cannot say, well, my successors will never prosecute this case. B, beyond this point, I am largely in accord with the majority's thoughtful analysis, and I join in its conclusion that Cosby's non-prosecution claim implicates due process and that contract law precepts generally, but more specifically, principles of promissory estoppel are the most natural fit for analyzing it. I agree that Cosby has proven his entitlement to relief because Castor reasonably expected Cosby to act in reliance upon his charging decision. Cosby relied to his detriment upon Castor's decision not to prosecute him and Cosby's reliance was reasonable. How can it be reasonable if the press statement specifically says that the state attorney may change his mind? I, I, I don't understand. With respect to reasonableness, I find particularly apt the majority's explanation that if Cosby's reliance was unreasonable, then reasonableness would require a defendant in a similar position to disbelieve an elected district attorney's public statement and to discount the experience and wisdom of his own counsel. The constellation of these unusual conditions requires the conclusion that Cosby's reliance was reasonable under the circumstances. Then he says, again, there's no mention, they're not mentioning that statement that was contained in the press release, where it says, and I read it to you guys earlier, the press release specifically says, I'll, I'll, I'll find it later, that the, the, the district attorney might change his mind uh, if there is different evidence, I'm assuming. All right, C, where I begin to disagree with the majority is in the final stretch of its analysis. Although the majority presents a compelling discussion of the promissory estoppel and due process principles at play in this matter, it ultimately concludes 
that the subsequent decision by successor district attorneys to prosecute Cosby violated Cosby's due process rights. I cannot agree. It is not the mere fact that another district attorney sought to prosecute Cosby after Cosby made an unauthorized and invalid declaration, there would be no such prosecution that resulted in the due process violation. Rather, it was the prosecution's use at the subsequent criminal trial of the evidence obtained in the civil case concerning Cosby's use of drugs to facilitate his sexual exploits that violated his due process rights. This evidence would not have been available for the for use in the criminal case if Castor had not been had not induced Cosby to believe he had no choice but to forfeit his Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination in the civil depositions. Importantly, though it was not until this evidence was actually introduced at trial at Cosby's criminal trial that he was harmed and the due process violation occurred. So remember, the majority pretty much is saying that the case, the conviction is thrown out, he can never be prosecuted again. The dissent is saying there was never any promise, but the trial was unfair, he should receive a new trial. The concurring judge is now saying, I agree with most of what the majority says, however, I don't think that you have to throw out the conviction and discharge him forever, and he can never be prosecuted for the stuff that happened with um, Andrea Constant. But instead, instead, they should prosecute him without the evidence that was obtained from through the civil case. I mean, I'm guessing that's what he's saying or she's saying. I'm not sure again. This is a male or female justice. So let me read a little more. The majority's misidentification of when the due process violation occurred here leads it to also supply the wrong remedy. The majority concludes that only full enforcement of that decision not to prosecute can satisfy the fundamental demands of the process. According to the majority, anything less under these circumstances would permit the Commonwealth to extract incriminating evidence from a defendant who relies upon the elected prosecutor's words, actions, and intent, and then use their evidence against the defendant with impunity. But the majority's own statement proves that there is an obvious alternative remedy that more narrowly, but still fully compensates Crosby for the due process violation. We can simply preclude the prosecution from using that evidence against the defendant with impunity, i.e. we can suppress that evidence. And in fact, this is precisely what the court and many others have done in comparable situations, which that makes 100% sense to me. I mean, why don't you just suppress the evidence and say, okay, well, new prosecutors, you can still charge him, just you cannot use the stuff that was obtained through the civil depositions in which he testified only because he received a promise from the prior prosecutor that no charges would be filed. So, then uh, I think this justice gives the legal analysis about why, you know, suppressing the evidence is the proper way to go. So I would, uh, the conclusion, I would reach a similar conclusion in this case. Specific performance is only appropriate in drastic circumstances, such as where the defendant detrimentally relies on an inducement and cannot be returned to the status quo ante. So basically, you know, like the status quo is um, what happened, you know, the, where he was before he relied on that promise, right? Um, here, although Cosby detrimentally relied on Cost Castor's inducement, we can return him to that position he enjoyed prior to being forced to surrender his Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination by simply suppressing the evidence derived from the civil depositions at which he testified. We should not use Castor's blunder to place Cosby in a better position than he otherwise would have been in by forever barring his prosecution. So drastic a step merely increases to an intolerable degree interference with the public interest in having the guilty brought to 
book that is brought to justice. And then just Chief Justice Barr joins in the and this Justice Doherty's concurring and dissenting opinion. So we have a total of seven justices. Um, so four of them voted for a full victory for Bill Cosby. Sorry for all the paper noises, but this is a huge, huge opinion. 79 pages. So let's see. So Justice Todd, Donahue, and Mundy joined the majority opinion with that was written by Justice Wetch. So, so there are four justices in the majority opinion that basically discharged. Um, basically, there's no more case against uh, Bill Cosby, no criminal case. And then two of them disagreed, but agreed in part and disagreed in part. So basically disagree with the remedy primarily. And then one of them just completely disagreed, but would grant instead a new trial on the basis of the fact that some of the evidence that was admitted at the trial to that particular justice was unfair. So that's it. If you guys are interested in learning all the details of the allegations of what happened between um, Cosby and Miss Constant about all this um, other crazy evidence that came into the case uh, against uh, Bill Cosby. You can read the 79 pages of the majority opinion. I'm just going to randomly pick one part so you guys see. You. Page 43, the Superior Court added that the trial court did not err in determining that the probative value of this evidence outweighed its potential for unfair prejudice in as much as in a vacuum Cosby's use and distribution of then of a then legal party drug nearly half a century ago did not appear highly prejudicial and only becomes significantly prejudicial and fairly so when in the context of other evidence it established Cosby's knowledge of and familiarity with central nervous system the presence for the purposes of demonstrating that he was at least reckless in giving constant such a drug before having sexual contact with her. Blah, blah, blah. So, very interesting opinion on the very complex uh, issue of the prosecution of sexual cases, particularly of older sexual cases, of cases where there's no, um, you know, smoking gun evidence, right? I mean, obviously, it is easier to prosecute cases where there's a you know a random person gets a victim on the street uh, commits a sexual act of misconduct there's physical evidence all of those are easy to prosecute uh, it's obviously a lot more complicated to not only prosecute but also pursue civil claims when it comes to allegations of sexual misconduct date rape and all those things when um there's not an immediate report of the incident when there's some contradicting evidence, when there was some kind of relationship between the perpetrator and the victim, when, um, you know, th th those are very complicated cases to prosecute. There's a lot of people in the jury panel that will have very strong positions about, you know, in favor of one side or against another side. So, you know, a lot of victim blaming happens in those cases from the defense, uh, and it's pretty awful, of course. But in a sense, the defend has to defend the accused, and it's just complex issue that someday I may address, break it down and address in more detail someday. But I wanted to give you guys a little better understanding of what happened in the Bill Cosby case today. I do appreciate all of you guys who uh, made contributions today um, for me to um, keep doing this. I appreciate it and. I thank all of your support, very much so. I'm glad to see you, Miss Shelley, again here. I, have, I haven't seen you here for a while. So the essence is not that Bill Cosby will get a new trial. He's not going to get a new trial. He's being discharged. In essence, 
the criminal case against him was thrown out by the Supreme Court of the state of Pennsylvania. So there's no more conviction. He's not a convicted guy because I'm assuming that was the only criminal case. I didn't see any evidence of any other criminal cases pending against him. So, <laughs> so in essence, he's off. And uh, the fact is that I know that there are some people that are happy and some people that are very upset. I can tell you that I spoke to somebody shortly before I began this video. I'm not going to say who, but it's somebody I know. It's a female, and she was happy. I was like a little puzzled about that, but she was happy. I, I know. Because obviously, you know, Bill Cosby was much beloved by many people. And um, it is confusing, you know, because... A lot of these victims, you hear some of the details about the issue with Andrea Constant, and what do you hear? What, what are the factors here that we can consider? Okay, well, first of all, she was an adult. Second of all, she was a professional. She was a former college basketball player, therefore had college education. She had a professional job at university. She was aware that he was making advances towards her, and then yet she kept going back to him. I'm assuming because obviously, you know, it's, you know, he's Bill Cosby. He's that awesome guy and all this stuff. So a lot of people have negative feelings about uh, someone who, in a sense, even accepted pills without knowing what they were from a guy whom she knew was making sexual advances to her, who a guy who told her, oh, this is to make you, you know, to feel more relaxed. So th there is a lot of... Um, negative feelings in this particular case i can tell you just from my brief conversation with the, the person that i talked to before i started this video who felt that and she apparently knew a lot more about the case than i did because i knew almost nothing about it she felt that that whatever happened to bill cosby was wrong and so i i did not have a position before i mean obviously i can tell from reading this opinion that he did engage in a lot of things that were inappropriate and um, that's that's the interesting um, thing about the situations that involve uh, crimes that involve sex is that if it involves consent, you know, adults, those things are much harder to prove um, because there's a lot of people that are going to have negative feelings about some of the things that the victim did in this case. In any case. Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll discuss this issue some other time. Tomorrow, we're going to have a live stream from the courthouse. Emmy is going to do it. She's going to be covering the sentencing if it happens. So y'all maybe remember the case involving Nicoletta Koikos. She's the daughter of a restaurant, of a owner of a restaurant who was convicted a couple of months ago Late at night, I was covering that trial. I streamed that trial live. She was convicted of, I think it was DUI manslaughter for running over her boyfriend, crushing his skull. And uh, her defense attorney filed a motion for new trial. That's going to be heard tomorrow afternoon. And if it is denied, which I'm assuming is going to be denied, but we never know. If the motion for new trial is denied, then immediately thereafter, she's going to be sentenced. So that's going to be covered tomorrow. During the day, I believe the hearing starts at 1.30 or 2.30 in the afternoon, Eastern Time, United States. She will be doing that live. Tonight, there will be an Emmy show. She will be talking about that case. She will probably play a few portions of that trial and uh, remind you of what the case was about so that if you never watched the Nicoletta Koikos trial, you can just come to the show tonight and learn about the case, and you'll learn what it's all about, and then tomorrow you can just watch the sentencing. All right? Thanks, everybody. Nice to see you, Anna, as well. Again, thanks, everybody, for the support. Until next time, Mental Lawyer.